Well, good morning, City Church again. Come on, y'all can do better than that. Good morning, City Church. Good morning. It is good to be here with you all this morning. I feel a little bit bigger now. I'm not used to standing on stage with somebody that's taller than me, so Femi was towering over me, but it's, it's good to be up here by myself. Amen. So um, this morning, I just want to start by saying thank you to Jesus, who is the Lord of my life. He's the Lord of this church and the Lord of all those who call him Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 And uh, I want to give just a special thanks to um, your church, uh, just all that God is doing in through you, all the staff here at the church. Y'all, they have shown me um, parts of Lagos that I, Lagos, I don't know if people have seen before. Lecky, I've been almost in a fight, as I told you before. I've been able to watch and see just the way the city operates and... I'm excited about what God's doing in and through this church. I want to give thanks to your leader, your pastor here, Pastor Femi. I don't know if you all do this here in your culture, but um, across the U.S., they, we don't do this enough in terms of honoring our, our leader and our pastor. This brother, every time I speak with him, every time I sit with him, I leave encouraged. I leave challenged. I leave inspired. He's probably one of the smartest guys I know. Maybe some of y'all know that. And he, he, <laughs> Yeah, he, he is, uh, yes, I want to just give God glory for this man this morning, as well as his wife, Tosin. They have been putting their hands to the plow, working hard to see this church planet here in this city, in this place. And I know that it's just the beginning for you all, and I'm looking forward to what God's going to do. Can you guys put your hands together if you love your pastor and wife? Thank you for them. As he told you earlier and he pointed out and you saw a picture of my family, I, I love my wife. If she was here, I would tell you she's the aftershave on my bald head. She is the sugar in my Kool-Aid. She is the wonder in my Wonder Bread, the spice in my Jollof rice. She is all of that and more. I love me some her. And uh, if you didn't know I didn't love her, then you just got to look at all the kids we have. Um, <laughs> I love me some her. We have five kids, and um, they are a blessing, and I'm thankful for each one of them. They are missing me. I'm missing them. I can't wait to get home to them um, tomorrow. Um, but this morning, and as, and as he told you, let me tell you a little bit more about our church. I said it's a multi-ethnic church, and one of the reasons we, we went to Chicago, Illinois, you may not know much about Chicago, but Chicago is one of the most divided racially and socioeconomic cities in America. And so we went to Chicago in a city of neighborhoods. It's 220 micro neighborhoods inside of 77 neighborhoods, systemically divided as well as people. And we said, look, if anybody's going to bring people together from all different backgrounds, different races, different socioeconomic backgrounds, the only person that can unite people, and I mean bring them together in a way that they will stay together, is Jesus. So by God's glory, we came in and we've been able to see people from all different races, different backgrounds, different socioeconomic backgrounds, all together under the banner of Jesus in Chicago. And like for your church, it's just the beginning of our church. We have 200, 300 so people that are coming, that are gathering together, and God has been glorified in that city. And I say this, and I say it's probably the same thing for your church. If God saw fit to, to move Renewal Church, which is the name of our church, out of the city of Chicago, I would want Chicago to miss us. And what I mean by miss us is that we were so for the good of the city. We were so for seeking the welfare of the city that if we were moved from the city, they would say, what happened? Where'd the church go? And that's the same prayer I have for your church. That's the same thing I want to see here. And as I said again, this is just the beginning because I believe it's already happening. Amen? Amen. Well, as you heard the word read, we're going to get into Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. And we've got a lot to cover today and in this time that we have. But today I want to preach simply on the topic, hope that compels. Hope that compels. Can you say that with me? Hope that compels. Before I go any further, though, I'd like to pray, if you pray with me. Father God, thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for just the worship, God, and that we're in a place where we're privileged to be and be able to sing praises to your holy name. Lift up our voices knowing what you've done for us, God. And that's why we do it. A, a, a praise, God, that 
even with our words, is still not actually touching the tip of thanks and all that you did for us. So, God, I just pray right now as I speak, Lord, that you would hide me behind the cross, that you would decrease me so that you would increase in this place. Father, have your way. Let your folks hear a word from you today and not from me. And it's in Christ's name we all said together. Amen. 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 Well, how many of you all remember being in high school? Some of you all may be still in high school, but <laughs> I remember in high school, going into my junior year, I learned that my football coach was leaving. Now, this is not football as you all call it here. We call it soccer. I think y'all got it right. I don't get where, I still don't understand how we call it soccer. But football in America, this is American football. And so if you look at me, I probably, you can probably tell I didn't play soccer, football here, right? Yeah, I played American football and my football coach was leaving, I heard one day. Now this was devastating news to me because I loved my coach. I loved him, you know why? Because he made the offense and defense center around me. I broke every state record in uh, history at our school as well as through the state. I was an All-American, a wide receiver on defense and an offense. I was the man. I was being recruited by just about every top school in the nation. Y'all, I thought I was the stuff. <laughs> Until I came back to school and met my new coach. My new coach, he said, he came to me, he said, Derek, you're the captain of the team. You're one of the biggest, fastest, strongest players on the team, and I'm putting in a new offense. And if I'm going to put in a new offense and you still want to catch the ball, you still want to be the man, that means I need to change your position. I'm like, okay, coach. You, you, I'm biggest, fastest, strongest player on the team. Okay, yeah. I'm the captain. Coach, I will listen to you. Because I believe in you, I trust you, I think you know what you're doing. So I'll change my position and I'll play this position, which he was calling tight end. Now, many of you probably don't know what that is. And at the time, I had no idea what playing tight end meant. Have you ever said yes to something be too quick? <laughs> you have no idea what they're about to say to you. And, and you're like, yeah, I'll do it. I got it. I got it. And you, Two seconds later, you're like, oh, my gosh, why did I say yes? I said yes too quick. He told me what tight end was, and he said he's putting in this new play called the sweep. So I learned out real quick what playing tight end meant. So tight end is the lead blocker on the sweep play. So if you've ever seen football, maybe even rugby, where, where somebody's blocking in front of the person with the ball. See, I'm the lead blocker, and the whole object of my position is to help the running back with the ball get to the end zone. So he's going to cut off of my block. So if I block down to the left, He's going to cut outside and go to the end zone. I can see the end zone. I can see what's in front of me. He can't see it. He's trusting me to get to the end zone. If I block outside, he comes inside of me. So what happens is I get in my three-point stance just like this, and I get ready. They call to play. They say, hike. I go this way. He goes outside of me. Now, hear me. I used to love this play until I found out we'd run this play 90% of the time which meant, sadly, that I was only going to get the ball 10% of the time. So I went from being one of the highest recruits in the nation to a mediocre recruit in the biggest year of my high school career. But don't you know this play took us to a 10-2 and two record? One of the best records in my high school history in 20 years. And I ended up going to play Division I football, which is the top in the United States. So it all worked out for the good. But I know you're sitting there saying, well, why, what in the world does this have to do with this text? What does this have to do with Acts chapter 1? What does this have to do with the Bible? I'm glad you asked. Hear me, life with Jesus in many ways is much like playing tight end in the sweet play. Don't miss this. If you call yourself a believer, meaning you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, God has not saved you for yourself. 
He's not saved you just for yourself, but hopefully so that you can lay down the block. Or in other words, share your life so that others through your life can get to the end zone, which is Jesus. See, as believers, we're all just a bunch of tight ends. We're just a bunch of tight ends laying down the block for someone else. You know Jesus. As a believer, you know him, which means you know your end zone. But there are people outside of these walls, outside of this room, that have never heard of Jesus. That have been hurt by church. Don't want to step foot in here. And the church they're going to get or the Jesus they're going to see is you. Jesus calls us to share our lives. But see, here's the thing. This isn't just a message for believers to get all amped up and say, I'm going to go out and I'm going to share my faith. I'm going to share with everybody I see. Because here's the truth. If we're honest this morning, I think we all struggle with this. We struggle with what we believe. Why we believe what we believe. Why should we actually share with someone else our faith? I mean, we struggle with it. Can y'all be honest with me? I mean, sometimes church is just a checklist item. We do it to get it done. But outside of here, our life, you wouldn't know that we're Christians. I mean, we live in a world that screams, do for me, do for me, do for me. But when we read the Bible, when we see what Jesus says, he says, do for others, do for others, do for others, which is completely opposite of what the world says. So today in our passage, I want to look at what it means to be released, to go out, to impact the city, to impact the world for Jesus. And what I what I want to look at is why and what keeps us living for him, because it's easy in our world to get consumed with ourselves and forget that as believers, we're on this earth not to make much of ourselves, but to make much of Jesus. This is what we see happening right here in the book of Acts in Acts chapter one. Jesus is telling his disciples, he tells them, you, you know, these truths. You, you know what I've done. You know what I've taught you. Now go share it with others. Make disciples. Here are the disciples that have walked with Jesus. They've talked with him. They've lived with him. He's poured his life out on them. And now he's about to ascend to heaven. But before he goes, he says, you will receive power from the Holy Spirit and you will be my witnesses. Jesus is com commissioning them to do the work of a missionary, to carry on in the work that he started after he's left this earth. He's basically telling them, now that you have seen me do everything that I've done, now that you've seen me lay down my life for you, now that you've seen me be a sacrifice for you, go do the same. Lay down a block for someone else to get to the end zone. Me. So today, again, I want to look at three truths. I want to look at three truths. The three truths we have in Jesus that keep us walking faithfully in him. I want to focus on what we know is true about Jesus and the hope we have in him, which in turn should make us desire to want to live for him. So, again, we're not going to focus so much on how we live for Jesus, but more so why. See, because anybody can go to church. Anybody can go to church once, twice a week. Anybody can do community service. Anybody can give money or do some other benevolent act. But the question we must answer is why do we do it? Is it because we're compelled by the gospel of Jesus Christ to do so? Or is it because we feel obligated to do so? There's a big difference. Today I want to talk about these three truths. Number one, the hope in his resurrection. And number two, the hope in his ascension. And number three, the hope we have in his return. Again, it's three. Number one, the hope in his resurrection. Number two, the hope in his ascension. And number three, the hope we have in his return. These hopes are what will keep us running through the storms of life, being tight ends, laying down blocks, for those around us in order to get to that same end zone, Jesus. Now to begin with just a bit of context as we walk through this scripture today, uh, 
You got to go to school before you actually start looking at the passage. The book of Acts is believed to be written by Luke, by most scholars, and it said that he's writing to a man by the name of Theophilus. Now, we're thinking and believing that Theophilus is one of his disciples. We don't know much about Theophilus, but he opens up in this passage and he says in verse one, I've dealt with what Jesus began to do and teach, which alludes to the fact that he's going to continue to talk about what Jesus taught and what he's going to do. But this time it's through the church. Now, looking at verses two through three, we see Jesus presenting proof that he's risen from the grave. You see this where he's showing his hands, he's showing his feet. And by him showing proof that he's risen from the grave, that shows that he has defeated sin and death. Verse three talks about Jesus presenting himself to the disciples with the holes in his hands and in his feet. These first few verses are significant. You just can't read over them and skip through them really quickly because I need you to do this with me. Could you imagine for a moment being one of these disciples right now? Could you imagine what they're feeling right now? Could you imagine what they're going through? They walked with Jesus. They talked with Jesus. They hung with Jesus. They ate with Jesus. They just saw him die one of the most gruesome deaths throughout human history, death on a cross. Could you imagine the hurt they're feeling right now? Could you imagine the sadness they're feeling right now? Could you imagine the betrayal that some of them are feeling right now on their part what, what they, they left Jesus but here in our text they see their risen Lord dwell with them not one day not two days but for 40 days they get to touch his wounds wounds like Thomas putting his hands or his fingers in his the holes in Jesus's hands I mean could you imagine now the the, the amazement the joy that they feel that Jesus has come back. Could you imagine this? I mean, this is kind of confusing to me. When, when you think about it, they went from being sad that Jesus is gone, mad at people for what they did to Jesus, feeling betrayal, feeling all these different down feelings, and now they get this big high. This, they're all the way up here. Jesus has come back. Jesus is with them. I mean, they're probably feeling sad that he's gone. They're feeling up oh, because he's back. Then they're doubting the fact, is this really Jesus? Could you imagine? That's like a roller coaster ride of emotions, up and down, over and all over the place. Anybody like roller coasters? You like going up and down all the time? You like big bumps and just your belly is just, ooh, it's like that. I mean, it doesn't feel good. That's like a roller coaster of emotions. Jesus is back one day, and then he's gone one day. Is this really you, Jesus? Could you imagine what they're feeling right now? And y'all, I've never seen anybody risen from the grave, have you? No. I, I can bet that the disciples are not fans of Tupac either. <laughs> Sitting around like, is there a heaven for a G? I wonder if he's coming back. <laughs> no, they're not thinking that. Jesus is sure enough dead. We saw him go into a tomb. They laid him in a tomb. We saw him die on the cross. Jesus died. But now that he's risen from the grave and he stays with them for 40 days. Family, what I'm trying to get at is that there's hope in the resurrection. There's hope in the resurrection. Hear me, those of us that believe we're no longer enemies of God, but we're justified or declared legally right in God's sight solely because of what Christ did on the cross for us, his death. His burial, his resurrection. God loved us. God gave his son to us for a sacrifice. And then we believe in him and we live forever. It's the gospel. But see, the truth of the matter is that as we can celebrate what Christ did for us, none of that is true without Christ's resurrection. None of that. I mean, if Christ didn't rise from the grave, then, then, then we would not be redeemed. If he didn't rise from the dead, then we would not be declared legally right in God's sight. Without the resurrection, there is no redemption. When Christ rose, he conquered sin and death. He got up from the grave because when he died, he only took sin and death to the grave. And if that's all he did without the resurrection, Christ would have just been a good guy that we would have remembered and said, oh, he did great things. He healed some people. He did some miracles, but that's not how the story ends, is it? 
Somebody say he got up. Jesus got up from the grave. Death couldn't hold him down, as the song says. Hear me, family. The resurrection completes our redemption. He died. He was buried and he rose. We cannot be justified without the resurrection. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 13 through 14, he says these words. But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Notice these words. He says that without Christ's resurrection, our faith is in vain. In other words, our faith is meaningless without the resurrection. It's Christ's resurrection that completes our redemption. But friends, you, you know what brings me the most joy when I read these verses? When I read what Paul says here, what brings me the most joy is that Christ, he's not just talking about Christ's resurrection. But you look at verse 13, he, he's talking about the resurrection of the dead. That's you and me. The fact that one day, all of us that have placed our faith in Jesus, we will be raised to live in eternity with him forever and ever. That's good news. Friends, faith in Christ's resurrection is important because without it, there is no hope. If he hadn't risen, then our faith would mean nothing. It's the resurrection that gives us hope, the resurrection that makes redemption complete. But I'm not sure if some of you guys get this. Some of you are looking at me like, what is he talking about? It's, it's kind of like this. It's, it's kind of like, hey, have y'all ever eaten a, a peanut butter and jam sandwich before? No, y'all don't do that here. In, in America, we eat peanut butter and jam. We call it jelly. Peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It probably sounds nasty to you guys. It's like, it's like rice and peas for us in, in, in America. We, we love peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And here's the reality. You can't eat a peanut butter and jam sandwich without both ingredients. You follow me with that? You can't have one without the other. So growing up where I'm from, I used to love these type of sandwiches because I grew up in a single mother household where it was just me, my, my mother, and three little sisters. And so we didn't have much. So to pull out the peanut butter and jam sandwich, it was like heaven because we got to eat it. And, and see, here's the reality. You got all these different types of breads where everybody's trying to make a peanut butter and jam sandwich healthy. Ain't nothing healthy about a peanut butter and jam sandwich. <laughs> So, you know, so you can't pull out the wheat bread. You see somebody make this with wheat bread. You're like, what is wrong with you? You got to get you got to get the white bread, the stuff that's unhealthy, all that mess in it. And you you start putting the peanut butter on it and you put it thick on there. And then you put the jam on there to the point where it's just it's just seeping into the pores of the bread. And then you put it together and it's so mushy. It's just some really good goodness. But you can't have one without the other. So I, I, some days I would come home from school and I would just be craving a good peanut butter and jam sandwich. So what I would do is I'd start, I'd go into the cupboard, I'd grab out the white bread, pull it out, get me two slices of bread. I put them on the table. I'm getting all ready. My, 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 my knife, my butter knife is shined really good and it's ready to go. So I pull out my bread, I get the peanut butter out and I start putting it on the bread just like this. And it, I'm, my mouth is starting to water because I want this peanut butter and jam sandwich. And then I go to the refrigerator and I'm looking for the jam. I'm moving everything around to find this jam. I'm looking my mouth is watering. I'm sweating now because I can't find it. Where is the jam? It's not in the refrigerator. And come to find out, we don't have any jam. <laughs> I mean, it's the worst thing when you're looking for something. You're getting all your ingredients out. You're getting ready for it. You're craving this one meal. You're looking for it. And then you find out you don't have one of the main ingredients. We didn't have any jam. It ruined me. 
You know, so what I started to do, and, and this is what we do, we get creative with it. When you grow up in the hood, the ghetto, you get, you get creative with what you're going to eat now. So I take out the, the bread and I start putting sugar on my, my, my peanut butter. I'm like, it's got to taste, something's got to go on here. Some, some, some honey on it. I'm putting it on there. I'm like, oh man, this is, this is got, if you're like my wife, she's really healthy. She's a personal trainer. She'll put spinach on it. I'm like, that's just nasty. It, you don't put, it's not healthy. You can't make it healthy. So she puts it on there and, and my kids ended up eating it. But see, here's the reality. What I'm trying to get at is that you cannot have a peanut butter and jam sandwich without both ingredients. So all these substitutes, when you're starting to eat it, you're eating it in your mouth. You're like, <laughs> you're choking because the peanut butter can't go, on, go down because the jam helps the peanut butter sandwich go down your throat. Y'all not following me with this. <laughs> see, here's the reality. Without both of the main ingredients, it's incomplete. Do not miss what I'm saying, family. Here's what I'm trying to get at. Redemption without the resurrection is incomplete. It does not work. It is the resurrection that gives us hope to keep going and living for Jesus. Because not only has Christ risen, but Paul just told us in Corinthians that if we believe one day Christ is coming back for us. That leaves us with an immense amount of joy in the fact that Jesus has risen from the grave. Amen? Amen. Family, Jesus' work on our behalf gives us hope. It gives us joy beyond any trial, any problem we may face because he's already conquered it all when he rose. Which means that I don't have to fret. I don't have to worry about what's happening around me or to me right now. As much as it may, may feel bad, it may sadden me, Jesus has conquered it. He's conquered the world. I just need to believe and endure and keep my eyes on him. Friends, the resurrection gives believers hope. But in the text... That's not the only truth that gives believers hope. Secondly, Christ, his ascension gives us hope because of the gift he gives believers when he ascends. Look at it with me in verses four through nine. See, before we just looked at how Christ resurrected from the dead. But now he's going to leave them again. So the question becomes, if I'm one of the disciples, if I'm walking with Jesus, how am I supposed to have joy when you're leaving me again? Jesus, you just got back. Now you're leaving me again? Where's the joy in that? But the joy comes because before he goes, don't miss what he says, he reassures them with the promise of the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a lot going on here, and I know you have been talking about the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, and I, I don't want you to get lost in all of this right now. The point I want you to take away is that although Jesus is leaving the earth to go back to heaven, he does not leave his disciples with all, without all they need to keep going without him. Amen. Don't miss that. Therefore, a believer in here that may have walked in here and you feel alone right now, you feel like the weight of the world is on your shoulders. You have been going through it. There's so much happening around you. You feel like you're on an island by yourself and you can't do this by yourself. I'm not going to make it. Here's the truth. If you believe in Jesus, you're not alone. You're not by yourself. The Holy Spirit, third person of the Trinity, is with you. And he's probably closer nearer than ever before he's with you you're not by yourself let me put it this way that have you ever had someone in your life like a friend a spouse a close loved one where life didn't feel complete when they're when they're not in your presence I mean it, it feels like something is missing when they're not with me it feels like they're not here. There's a part of my heart that is missing. You got that friend, that spouse, that, that person in your life, maybe somebody that, that's been really close to you. When they're not there, it just feels like there's something that's not, that's not right. 
And if you have that person in your life when they're not around you, you probably have something of theirs that you keep. Maybe it's a picture. I mean, some people are weird, maybe a piece of hair, you know, it's just, you, you have something that's theirs. And it reminds you of them, even though they're not physically with you, it reassures you that they're still there. You got that item in your life? That picture that, that, that maybe it's a bear or something, something of, of, of theirs that you keep that reminds you of them. Well, my wife and I, we're, we're high school sweethearts. I met her in high school, and I remember being in high school, you, you know, you, you didn't have a whole, you, you couldn't see each other all the time. You know, so me being romantic, yeah, I got, I'm romantic a little bit, you know. <laughs> Valentine's Day, we, we, you know, I, I bought her, this is a day we celebrate, and you know, you, you celebrate your sweetness, you know, you want to get them all the good stuff in the world. I didn't have a whole lot of money, but I bought her a box of her favorite chocolate. She loves dark chocolate. So I bought her a box of her favorite. I don't like dark chocolate. She likes dark chocolate. I think it's, uh, you can't. She, she likes that, and, you know, so she was, she's eating it. And, and I also bought her this Build-A-Bear. I don't know if you've heard of a Build-A-Bear before, but it's a bear that you go into the store and you actually build the bear. You can stuff it, you can dress it, you can make it the way you want it. So I put earrings in the build a bear's ear, ears where she had to find the earrings and then in the palm of the hand I put this little recording that says something like this, baby, I love you. And you know, although I'm not always going to be there with you, all you got to do is push this hand and you can hear my voice. Y'all go ahead and laugh, it's okay. <laughs> Ain't no shame in my game. It worked. <laughs> Fifteen years later, she's still with me. Five kids. It worked. But don't you know to this day, my wife, she still has that bear. As dingy as it is, with my romantic recording on it. So whenever I'm gone, all she has to do is press the palm of that bear. Friends, hear me. Jesus knew what he meant to his disciples. He knew that he was about to leave. So what does he do? He says, before I go, when I go, you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. Me and spirit, I'm not leaving you. Someone else is coming. That's far greater than any Build-A-Bear. He says all of this before he gives them the tall order of being witnesses to the rest of the world. He assures them in his ascension by giving them the Holy Spirit, a counselor, a friend in need, someone to guide them when no one else is there, when them by themselves, they cannot do what he's called them to do. They're not up to the task. See, Jesus knew that the disciples could not be his witnesses without him. Because hear me, Jesus is the only one that can save. You see, this is a key point. Let me say that again. Jesus is the only one that can save because some of us may have some Jesus complex in us. And we believe that we're the ones that are supposed to save somebody. So when they don't come to the faith or they don't do what we think they're supposed to do, we get upset. We get sad about it. Hear me. Jesus is the only one that can save. So you stay diligent, endure the process, keep living your life and keep your eyes on them and pray for everyone else, too. Amen. He's the only one that can save. Family, we don't have what it takes to fulfill the mission of being witnesses of a holy God, not by ourselves. If we're honest. That's the key word, honest. We're self-serving. We're dirty. We're grimy. We're sinful people, including myself. But with the Holy Spirit, believers have all that they need. We that believe we're prepared because we're not relying upon our own strength. We're not relying upon our own power to make it through this world where things happen like corrupt politics or, or murder all over the world. Violence happen all over the world. You see, we don't have the power or the strength to get through that. Some days I get so down, I'm like, God, I can't take this anymore. God, I, I don't think I can make it through this. We get upset about traffic. God, I don't think I can, I can do this anymore. 
And the reality is we're not meant to be able to do it by ourselves. The hope is not in us getting through it. That, that's hopeless. But as believers, we're able to prevail. We're able to endure. We're able to keep going because we're not relying upon our own power or strength, but we're relying upon Jesus. His power, his strength. It's not us, it's him. Jesus has not left believers by themselves, but the question then becomes, well, are you heeding the Holy Spirit? Friends, we cannot simply live this life by our own merit or by our own strength, but instead, if we call ourselves believers, we have to listen. We have to listen and live according to the Spirit of God. And the follow-up question becomes, well, how do I know what is the Spirit and what's not? Hear me, family. I'm going to give you something really simple. I can't break all of this down, but one simple piece is that the Holy Spirit is not in your feelings. He's not in how you feel. We get that wrong a lot of times. I feel up, so God is working. I feel down, God is not here. Our feelings, sway, they sway and they move like the wind and the waves. They change all the time, depending on the day and the time, the hour of the day. They, they change. But you know one thing that's true about God? He does not change. He stays the same. So that means that the Holy Spirit family, his leading is not in how we feel all the time. So here's how you know if the Holy Spirit's leading you. Y'all ready for it? Ready? Ready? It's simple. We have to be rooted and grounded in the Word of God. Because the Holy Spirit will never guide us contrary to the Scriptures. We know this because Jesus talks about the work of the Holy Spirit in John chapter 14 through 16. He says things like, he will glorify the Father in me, declare the same truths you, to you that I have. He will not speak on his own authority, but only on a, what's a, in accord with what I have said or what the Father has said. So I tell my folks at Renewal Church, I tell them when they come, they come to me all the time. They say, man, Pastor D, they call me Pastor D. The, 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 man, the Spirit is leading me. He's leading me to this place. I feel like I'm called to go here and, and he's working in my life. And I'm like, hey, that's so awesome. I'm glad that the Holy Spirit is working in your life, that he's moving. But I need you to show me in Scripture. Simple. I need you to show me in Scripture, because if you can't back what you're saying in Scripture, then uh, it's probably not the Holy Spirit moving in your life. It's probably what you feel right now. And that's tough, but it's simple. Friends, we have to know the word of God. We have to know the Bible in order to correctly discern God's leading in our life. God will never contradict himself. It's very simple. It's kind of like a dating relationship. How many of us are married in here? Don't be shy. How many of us are married? How many of us dating? Or have dated before? Go ahead. You, if you marry, you still should be dating. You see, when you're dating somebody, you don't just go on a date one time and just be like, I know everything about them. They're amazing. I'm going to marry them. I'm going to be with them for the rest of my life. That's not the way it works, right? In order to get to know them, you want to date them over and over again. You call them on the phone. You're hitting them up on Twitter and Instagram. You're learning everything about them. You want to be with that person over and over and over again. You talk all throughout the night. But why is it that when we come to our relationship with God, we just see him on Sunday morning? We read the Bible once a week. But yet we know everything about God. And here's the reality. If we're in a relationship with God, then that means we need to spend time getting to know him. Throughout the day, all throughout the day, not just on Sunday, not at our group throughout the week or our Bible study, but throughout the day, praying and reading our scriptures, getting to know what he says about us. It's the Holy Spirit living inside of believers that keeps us going day to day. But we have to know him and his word in order to know his leading. You see, many times we treat the Holy Spirit like he's some mystical being. When the truth of the matter, he's not. He's God. He's God in spirit. The third part of the Trinity 
God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, and he will never be contrary to Jesus or God. It's the Godhead, one God, three distinct persons, but all same nature, essence. It's one God, three persons in one. Friends, Christ knew believers couldn't walk through this world alone. So what does he do? He sends the Holy Spirit. He's with us, which should give believers hope. Lastly, if that's not enough to have hope in the resurrection or hope in the gift of his ascension, we have hope in Jesus' return. In our text, we see in verse 10 that after Jesus ascends to he heaven, the disciples, they're sitting there and they're still gazing into the sky. They're still watching the sky. They're looking in the heaven. They're looking as if Jesus, what, what happened to Jesus? I mean, could you, it's, it's kind of like sitting at a grave site. You're, you're seeing that body being lowered into the ground. You're seeing that person that you once loved there. They are no more. And no matter what anybody says to you, no matter about the hope you have of seeing them in heaven, it still hurts. They're still grieving. They're still mourning. It still hurts. These disciples, I mean, could you imagine what they're feeling right now? Their Savior, their Lord, who has been with them, who died for them, was and rose from the grave, been with them for 40 days now, has now left. So they're gazing into the sky, probably hopeless, some sad and some weeping at this time because Jesus is gone. And as they're sitting there gazing into the sky, it says two men in white robes appear. Look at verse 11. They say, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. They give the disciples hope in the return of Jesus during a time of need. See, the men give them something to look forward to, not just gazing in the heaven, but they give them a hope to look forward to. See, it's the fact that one day Jesus is coming back for his people. See, Jesus in his death, burial, and his resurrection, he saves us from the power and the penalty of sin. But one day he's coming back to save us from the very presence of sin. Amen. See, that's something to look forward to. No more sadness. No more tears. No more pain. No more suffering. No more temptation. No more murder. No more corruption. No more anything, anything else. It's just going to be goodness with us and God. But instead, believers, not sitting in all of that mess, we're going to be with him forever and ever in heaven. Family, if that's not good news, then I don't know what else is. To be released from all of this mess, that's good news. See, we don't place our hope in this world because it and everything else is going to perish. It's, going, it's not getting better. That doesn't mean that you won't go forward and things won't happen in your life. But the world as a whole is not necessarily getting better until Jesus comes back. But if we believe, we will be resurrected with him and live with him forever. See, that's where we hang our hats at the end of the day. It's not on what we can achieve. It's not on what we can gain. It's not on what we can get. It's on the fact that Jesus is coming back one day. He didn't just die and be buried. He rose, then he ascended, and he's coming back. Let me end with this, because I don't want you to miss this. How many of you all watch Netflix in here? Come on, just, you can be, I told you I need to be honest with me this morning. Netflix. My wife, my kids, and I, we love Netflix. We watch, well, you can sometimes, I'm gonna be honest, sometimes you can find me binging on Netflix. In my downtime, I'm sitting there and I'm watching Netflix and I, I just keep watching it. I mean, and it's easy to binge on Netflix. If we're honest this morning, it's easy. You're sitting there watching it and, you, you know, you watch about too many episodes already. Too many. That's about three, four. You know, you watch too many. And you're sitting there and you're like, man, I really need to go to bed. I got a big meeting tomorrow. I need to go to bed. But you keep watching and, and, and it's, it's easy to binge because it's like the five-second countdown and, 
and, and you're contemplating whether I need to go to bed or not. And by the time you get to the point of whether you're going to go to bed or not, the, movie, the started, it show's already started. You're like, you're like, well, I might as well go ahead and watch another one. I could get some sleep tomorrow. It's okay. Let me watch this show. Next thing you know, you're watching your show again. You see, the problem with that is that you keep watching the show, and then one day, the show ends. There's no more series. There's no more five second countdowns. Your series is over. And if you're like me, you can't wait till the next episode comes on. So you start getting on the internet. You start scouring the internet. When is it coming back out? And it says something very ambiguous. Oh, sometime next spring. You're like, oh my God. What am I going to do? My show is over. So what you do is you keep looking forward to it. And the next thing you know is you start seeing signs. You start seeing billboards. You start seeing commercials all around. And you're looking around and you're like, oh, my show is coming back. It's coming back. You're getting ready for it. So what do you do? You start getting your cupboard all fixed up right. You get your popcorn in there because your show is coming back. You get all the food you like because your show is coming back. You start telling your friends and your family, we're going to have a watch party because my show is coming back. You get your blankets all folded up nice because your show is coming back. House is all cleaned up because your show is coming back on. Family, what I'm trying to tell you, City Church, is that Jesus is coming back one day. The text told us that he left us, but he's going to come back the same way he went into heaven. John 10, 28 says, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Believers will live with Jesus forever, family. That's where we place our hope. We place it in Jesus, the truth of his resurrection, the gift in his ascension, and in his return. That hope, hear me, is what allows us to keep living our lives for him to keep loving him, to keep laying down the blocks, if you want to say, for others to get to him. Friends, the disciples understood this in the text. And after Jesus left with the help of the Holy Spirit, they took the truth of the gospel to the world. They were inspired and given hope beyond measure in Jesus' resurrection, his ascension, and his return. City Church, we too have that same hope in Jesus. We too have that same renewing power of the gospel working within us if we believe. This whole city, this whole country and world can be changed by what God wants to do through his church. If we stop holding on to everything we want, everything we want to do and instead we hold on to the hope we have this he wants to do a work through your church he's already began it and he's not done yet amen amen let's pray